Hello grade 10, so today we're going to continue with chemical bonding and in particular we're going to be looking at ionic bonding. Now if you've missed my previous videos where I've gone over the introduction to bonding and covalent bonding and Lewis dot diagrams involving covalent bonding, then you need to check out my previous video where I go over all of these types of examples and explain how covalent bonding works and how to draw Lewis dot diagrams for a covalently bonded molecule. Now the first thing that I wanted to point out is that there is a difference in how your Lewis dot diagram looks for a covalently bonded molecule, which we can see here on the left, this is water, H2O, versus an ionic bond, which we see on the right. Now, first of all, covalent bonding involves the sharing of electrons between atoms to form molecules or compounds. So sharing is the key word here, the sharing of valence electrons, and it takes place between a non-metal and a non-metal. Now, if you look at the covalently bonded diagram, we can see oxygen is a non-metal, hydrogen is a non-metal, and we can see that they share electrons. Here, we have a single pair of electrons shared. Here, we have a single pair of electrons shared. And when we say shared, we mean that those electrons, those two electrons, belong to both the hydrogen and the oxygen. They share it. So each hydrogen has one, two electrons, one, two electrons, and the oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it has reached its octet structure. But sharing is the most important thing, and non-metal and non-metal is the second most important thing. With ionic bonding, ionic bonding is different to covalent bonding, in that ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons to form cations, which are positively charged particles, and anions, which are negatively charged particles. And those two things, the positives and the negatives, attract each other and they form a formula unit or an ionic compound. It's very, very different. There's no sharing of electrons. There's a transfer of electrons. And when we look at the Lewis dot diagram, we can see that there's no sharing of electrons. There's a, there was a transfer. Basically, in this case, magnesium lost two electrons. So it lost, it transferred two electrons to the chlorine. And that's why it has a charge of two plus, because it lost two electrons. It transferred two electrons. And each chlorine atom, there's two of them, each chlorine atom gained that one electron over there. And therefore, each chlorine atom has a charge of minus one. Minus one because it gained one electron and there's two chlorines because each magnesium could give away two electrons. If this is confusing you, we will go over this exact example later on. But what I wanted to point out is that there's no sharing. Do you see over here? Covalent is sharing. We can see that the oxygen and the hydrogen are squashed up close together and this pair of electrons belongs to both of them as a sharing. Over here, there's no sharing. And we can also see brackets and charges. And the other important thing is that ionic is between a metal and a non-metal. So in this case, we can see that magnesium is my metal. And chlorine, the chlorine atom, is my non-metal. So that's very, very, very important. Ionic will always, always, always between, be between a metal and a non-metal. So essentially, when we draw a Lewis dot diagram to represent a covalent bond, we can see that there's no brackets and we don't show charges because this is the sharing of electrons versus when we illustrate an ionic bond and we represent it with a Lewis dot diagram, we do show brackets. The brackets basically indicates that the atom has reached a stable outer electron state. So basically the outer energy levels are full, the outer orbitals are full because they have transferred electrons. So the metal has lost electrons, the non-metal has gained electrons, and that has enabled them to form cations, which is a positive ion, and anions, which is a negative ion, and those two attract each other to form a formula unit. So we show brackets in order to indicate that there has been a loss of electrons or a gain of electrons that has allowed each of these atoms to reach a full outer energy level. And we show charges basically to show that this is the cation, it has lost an electron, this is the anion, it has gained the electron. So that's what the charges mean. So I hope you can see the difference between these two. The similarities between drawing a Lewis dot diagram for covalent and ionic bonds, so the thing that's the same, is that we use valence electrons in both of them. So we use the valence electrons of the atoms, which is the Roman group numerals on your periodic table. So this 
group, this um, this group over here has one valence electron. Your alkali earth metals have two valence electrons. This group over here, including boron, aluminium, they have three valence electrons. Carbon, silicone, and so on have four. Nitrogen, phosphorus have five. Oxygen, sulfur, and so on have six. Your halogens have seven. And that is what we use in order to draw our Lewis dot diagrams. Now, remember when we draw Lewis dot diagrams, we use symbols to represent the valence electrons. So oxygen, if you go back to a few seconds, you'll see that oxygen has six valence electrons. So we would say one, two, three, four. Then you start at the top again, five and six. That's how you draw the Lewis dot diagram for a single atom. Sodium has one. So you'll draw one. Chlorine is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six seven okay now i'm going to show you how we draw lewis dot diagrams for ionic compounds or formula units essentially an ionic salt and it says over here overall the compound is electrically neutral we use brackets around the atoms basically to illustrate that all eight electrons now belong to that atom so full out to energy levels and we can see here, I'm going to do this example over with you guys, but you can see sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, sodium has one valence electron because it's in group one, chlorine is a halogen, it has seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice how we use different symbols for different atoms. You show with an arrow that there's going to be a transfer of electrons. So that arrow basically says that sodium is going to lose that electron, chlorine will gain that electron. And then we use brackets around the sodium with a plus sign, a positive charge, to indicate that sodium has transferred that electron now to chlorine. Now think about this, electrons are negative. So if sodium loses one electron, it's going to form a positive ion, a cation. If you lose something that is negative, think about it, you lose a negative thing, you become positive. So plus one because it's lost one electron. Chlorine gains that electron. We can see here it is represented with that dot over there. So it still has its original seven X's to represent the original seven valence electrons around chlorine. And now it also has the dot. So that valence electron from sodium. And because it gained one electron, it gets a charge of minus one. Minus one because it gained one negative electron. So if we ask you to draw Lewis dot diagrams to show the formation of sodium chloride, your first step is to look at the compound sodium chloride or the molecule and you need to say, okay, sodium is Na, that is a metal. Chlorine is Cl, that is a non-metal. We know that a metal bonded with a non-metal will form an ionic bond. And we know that in our final Lewis dot diagram, we will therefore see charges. We will therefore see brackets. Now they say use Lewis dot diagrams or draw Lewis dot diagrams to show the formation of sodium chloride. So what that means is they want me to show all the steps. So not just the final product, not just sodium chloride. They want to see the formation of it, how it was made. So we start with sodium with one valence electron. Why is it one valence electron? Because it's in group one. Plus chlorine with seven valence electrons. I showed you how to do that in the previous few minutes. Then you need to show me an arrow to show that that electron is going to be transferred from the sodium to the chlorine. Okay, that arrow must be there. Then you draw me this, basically this final arrow to show me that plus that gives me or produces or forms this product. Because the sodium has lost an electron, it forms a ion of plus one. The sodium ion has a charge of plus one. You may draw brackets around this one as well, but in some cases they leave the brackets out of the cation. Then the chlorine gets that extra electron, there it is, the X, and it gets brackets around it, so always draw brackets around the anion, the non-metal, and it has a charge of minus one because it gained one electron. In example number two, we are going to show Lewis dot diagrams for the formation of magnesium and oxygen. It's going to produce magnesium oxide. Now, also another first step, a nice first step, if they don't give you the chemical formula, is to just figure out the chemical formula. So magnesium 
has a charge of plus two. It's in the second group on the periodic table. And oxygen has a charge of negative two. So that will form an electrically neutral compound. So therefore, the name is MgO. You don't need to do this beforehand, but it can help. We basically know that magnesium oxide will have one magnesium and one oxygen. But like I said, we can use Lewis dot diagrams to help us figure out that as well. So magnesium plus oxygen. Now let's take a look at magnesium's valence electrons. Magnesium on the periodic table has two valence electrons. And oxygen, oxygen is over here. Oxygen has six valence electrons. So magnesium has two, so I'm going to do one, two. Oxygen has six. One, two, three, four. Then we start at the top again. Five, six. What I want you to also take note of is I'm using crosses for magnesium and dots for oxygen. You need to use different symbols because if you use the same symbol, I'm not going to be able to tell in the final product which valence electrons come from magnesium and which one comes from oxygen. So what we can see from this is that magnesium has two electrons to give away. Oxygen has six. It has space over here for one more and over here for one more. Remember the octet structure, octet, tells me that this oxygen needs eight in order to be full and the magnesium needs to give away two in order to be stable. So magnesium, one of them will go there and the other one will go there. You draw an arrow to represent that you're showing me the final product now. Magnesium has lost both electrons, which means overall it'll have a charge of two plus. Now, if you're still not sure why it's two plus, it's because it lost two electrons. Oxygen. Now remember, oxygen originally had one, two, three, four, five, and six valence electrons represented by the circles. It gained an X, an electron from magnesium. It gained another X from magnesium. So how many electrons did it get extra? It got two electrons extra. So it has a charge of two minus. I hope that makes sense. And that is your final answer. If we do another example, chlorine and calcium, calcium is my metal. Just be careful. They swapped around the word here. The metal always goes first. Chlorine is my non-metal. Remember, the metal is the one that is going to give away electrons. And the non-metal is going to accept those electrons. So the transfer will go from metal to non-metal. Now, calcium, if you look at your periodic table, calcium has two valence electrons. So you can go check. Plus, chlorine has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, if you look at this very carefully, this is a more difficult example. Because look, what happens is chlorine has seven. It needs eight to reach octet structure. So one of these electrons will go there. But now calcium has an extra one and it wants to lose both of them grade tens. It needs to lose both of them in order for calcium to be stable. So when calcium gives this electron to this chlorine, chlorine is going to say, oh, yay, I'm stable. I'm happy. I'm good. But calcium is going to say, no, 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 wait, I still have an electron that I need to give someone. So because calcium has two electrons to give away, but chlorine only needs one, this calcium is going to bond with another chlorine atom okay one two three four five six seven so this electron will go to a second chlorine atom and therefore my final final product will look as follows calcium will now have lost two electrons giving it a charge of two plus two plus because it lost two electrons it became more positive two plus and chlorine now how many chlorines do you see two chlorines so you're going to put a big two over here in front of the chlorine brackets then you're going to use brackets and then you're going to say okay cool each chlorine had seven so one two three four five six seven and each of those chlorines got one extra electron 
and each chlorine, because each chlorine only got one extra electron, it's got a charge of minus one. So you might be confused. You might say, wait, 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 but there were two electrons given to chlorine. So why is it not two minus? Remember, each chlorine only gets one electron extra. Okay, so each chlorine gains one electron, so it must have a charge of minus one. But the big two over here indicates that I need not one chlorine, but two chlorines. And that's your final answer. Another way to figure out that you're going to need two chlorines is to do the naming for calcium um, chloride. So calcium chloride, calcium has a charge of plus two, chlorine has a charge of minus one. Therefore, in order to make this a neutral compound, okay, 2 minus 1 does not give me 0. I need to multiply this by 2. So it's CaCl2. If you've forgotten how to name or naming confuses you or you want more practice on that, I do have a video on naming which I will link over here. I wanted to show you one more um, slightly challenging example, potassium sulfide. Remember, potassium is K. Don't get confused. Phosphorus is P. Potassium is K. And sulfide is S. Okay, just also don't be confused. Sulfate is SO4 2 minus, the sulfate ion. Okay, sulfide is just S. Right, so potassium sulfide has a K and has an S. But we don't know how many Ks and how many S's, but just watch here. Potassium is a metal and sulfur, sulfur is a non-metal. Okay, because remember it's just sulfide because it's bonded. It's sulfur and potassium. Potassium sulfide. So now potassium is one valence electron. Look at your periodic table. Sulfur has six, just like oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now look, this potassium can give away one electron here to the sulfur. Then the potassium is happy, full, and stable because it got rid of its electron. But sulfur is not happy. Sulfur needs eight. If I have that extra electron, sulfur only has seven, it still has an open space over here. So basically what needs to happen is we need to include another potassium in order to give my sulfur the two electrons that it needs in order to be full. Okay, so one of the electrons comes from one potassium over there. The second electron comes from another potassium over there. Therefore, my final answer is potassium. Each potassium loses one electron, but I have two of them. And then the sulfur now has eight in total. Okay, that one from the one potassium and that one from the second potassium. So each sulfur gains two electrons. Okay, so I have one sulfur and two potassiums. Each potassium lost one electron. That's why there's a plus over there. In my next video, I'll be going over this past exam question involving bonding, Lewis dot structures and calculating molar mass. Let me know what else you want to see in the comments below. I hope you've subscribed so that I can help you with your physics, your math, your chemistry. Sending you all my love and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye everyone.